And now we will come to the keynote by Claudia Comito. And I'd like to introduce Claudia. Hi. Uh, Claudia Hello. is working in uh, Jülich, and uh, she is going to um, tell us about building of the Helmholtz analytics framework and the making of heat. Now, I don't really know a lot about what these things mean, so I hope you're going to tell us. But it sounds very interesting, and Jülich is, uh, is a, a you know, supercomputing center in Germany, so it definitely has to do a lot with high-performance computing, big data, and all these nice things that everyone talks about. So, Claudia, welcome to your Python. Thank you for giving a talk, uh, the, the keynote, and uh, I think we can now go ahead and take it away. So Hi. Uh, let's share the screen. Right, and I'll go off stage now, and uh, I'll stick, stick around, take notes of the questions, and then we can have the Q&A five minutes before the end. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot for the introduction, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me. I, uh, I really cannot put into words how astonishing it is for me to be talking at EuroPython. My background is actually in astrophysics. I only switched to scientific computing three years ago. The last thing I expected was uh, to be invited to EuroPython. Um, anyway, I'm glad you don't know much, or probably nobody knows much about these projects, because yes, I'm going to tell you about it, about them. Um, uh, what's interesting is, and I didn't quite realize at the time, but this project I joined in 2018 was a, a pretty impressive exercise in getting researchers to talk to each other. And uh, those of you in academia know that it might be difficult to get researchers to talk to each other, when, even if they're working on similar topics in the same building. So um, in this case, uh, the goal of the project was to get different, completely different uh, research groups uh, in different scientific fields to work and eventually adopt a common product. So I'm going to tell you about this and um, uh, in general, I think the project was quite successful, uh, but sometimes I realized some of the things that made the project a success could easily have gone completely in the other direction. So I'm going to try and, and take these things apart a bit and uh, look at the many ways that we were good and some of the ways that we were lucky. Okay, let's get started. Of course, uh, <laughs> you can't escape this, but interweaved into all of this is of course my personal journey out of fundamental research and into data science and uh, not like after my PhD or my first postdoc as most uh, researchers do but at a relatively senior age so um, let me say a few words about myself first of all uh, I'm originally from Italy I studied astronomy in Bologna and uh, moved to Germany about 20 years ago to write my PhD thesis on the uh, molecular content of star forming regions. And well, as things turn out, I never left Germany. So in fact, I've been a German citizen now for over, over 10 years. Um, everything considered, I worked, in, I worked in astrophysics for about 18 years. So that's including my, my PhD. So at first with the high altitude telescopes for the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy, in Bonn and uh, later um, with the Herschel Space Observatory data at the University of Cologne. And uh, well, I, I didn't really, it wasn't very obvious to me at the time, um, but I think I was already at the time more interested in the technicalities of data acquisition and processing uh, rather than in the analysis itself or in, the, in doing the research. So I often found myself in interface positions between technical people as we used to call them, and the astronomers, or the users, as the technical people call them. And uh, of course, I had been using Python and NumPy for data calibration and data analysis for all of my astronomer career. So I thought in 2017, I thought I was quite good at it. And uh, in hindsight, I am so glad I had no idea how much I didn't know before applying for this position at the Jülich Supercomputing Center. What I did know in my last years in fundamental research was that I had been living in a pretty unhealthy combination of bore out and uncertainty, job uncertainty for a bit too long. So, Yes, uh, I didn't come to realize the connection between, between those two things, uh, boredom and uncertainty, until later. But 
it's only recently that I've started to think of uh, projects or tasks in terms of uh, boredom versus perceived safety. But anyway, a good place where everybody tends to be or would like to be is there. And of course, safety and boredom will mean different things to different people. And actually this plot would, be, would need a time axis as well. Even the same person going through their different life phases will have very inhomogeneous perception of, of uh, what it means to be to feel safe. And uh, in my 20s and 30s or early 30s, not being bored meant being able to tinker with telescopes on some oxygen deprived mountain desert and being safe meant taking the oxygen bottle <laughs> up the stairs, even if it weighed a ton. So uh, I think it is a widespread phenomenon, at least from my Eurocentric perspective that we tend to associate job safety with boredom when we are younger. But later in my career, I realized that for me, at least for me, boredom on the job was actually inversely correlated um, to, uh, to safety. So the less job safety, the more I felt pressure to take on tedious, resource intensive tasks that I thought would make me indispensable and would give me job safety, but it, it doesn't work that way. So I guess what I'm trying to say in so many words is if you ever find yourself in that upper left corner on the boredom to safety plot, you know, feel free to start thinking about an exit strategy. <laughs> Um, yes, so I was lucky. My exit strategy materialized then as a job offer as a data analyst at the Ulysses Supercomputing Center in late 2017. And then I was hired in 2018 as a generalist kind of technical user representative kind of person within the Helmholtz analytics framework. And you can already tell at the time, I didn't have much idea what I was getting myself into. So I'm not sure how many of you are uh, actually versed in the uh, German publicly funded research landscape, the Helmholtz Association. Uh, I'm going to tell you a, a, bit, of, a bit about it. It's, a, it's the largest uh, research organization in Germany. They're mostly focused, uh, most focused on uh, engineering and life sciences. Um, and of course, computing, high performance computing, big science, big data is, uh, uh, is research infrastructure. So it's the glue that keeps it all together. The interesting is uh, the interesting thing I found is that the Helmholtz Association doesn't fund doesn't fund single research institutes. They focus on cross center research programs. So large cross discipline projects are already the norm uh, within the Helmholtz Association. What was new in 2016 was a uh, uh, call for proposals for the so called uh, information and data science incubator that was uh, initiated explicitly to found outstanding research projects in the general field of scientific big data or big science, as you want to call it. Okay, so the Helmholtz Analytics Framework was one of the six projects fun funded in the first incubator round in 2017. And the focus was on tackling big data challenges in applied science and life sciences and providing a, a generalized toolkit for data analytics. They would be then within this framework co-designed by uh, scientists and uh, developers. So um, let's see, here's a quick panorama view of the actual use cases. I don't, I'm not gonna go into the details simply because I, uh, I'm not a domain scientist in this, uh, in this uh, project. So I only understand the use cases very superficially, but um, we have a, an earth system. Uh, we had an earth system science um, use case. They are working on uh, modeling the interconnection between landmass, water bodies, atmosphere. They, and like every other uh, use case here, dealing with massive uh, simulation volumes, massive data sets. Um, we had some atmospheric science, so modeling the effect of uh, uh, climate change on, uh, on stratospheric ozone. We had two neuroscience uh, use cases. The first one uh, was more uh, uh, imaging 
uh, focus of trying to disentangle uh, the, the, the genetics from outside world effects on the human brain. And we had the, uh, some aerospace uh, or rocket science uh, uh, kind of uh, use case. In this, this picture represents uh, aircraft design by high precision, precision simulations. Um, we had structural biology, uh, trying to identify protein structure by machine learning uh, based on very few bits of information. And again, we had so the second neuroscience uh, um, use case that use, uses statistical analysis of a huge time series of uh, firing neurons to figure out what series of triggers actually corresponds to uh, actual connections in the brain. Anyway, the problem is common. The data are very large. They are huge. Uh, they need high performance computing. They are uh, also using similar methods for uh, um, dimensionality reduction. So that's where uh, our toolkit comes in. So the idea behind this is now in very simplified terms, let's put together a few compute heavy research projects from different fields, assign them a single group of scientific developers. They call, the, they call us information experts, uh, have to get used to that. Um, so and see if the mix can come up with a general toolkit that can serve first the use cases and then later the academic data science computing uh, community at large. So the buzzword here is co-design and uh, I'm not going to get into the details of how the several research teams were selected. You can imagine there was some politics involved, but the fact is that, as you have seen in the previous slide, the final selection of uh, eight research topics was uh, quite a bit more heterogeneous than anticipated. So all of these use cases had three things in common. They mostly dealt with monolithic multidimensional arrays. Their arrays were too large to be loaded in a, in a NumPy ND array. And yes, of course, there was agreement on the programming language of the toolkit, otherwise I wouldn't be here, I guess. Um, but otherwise, you know, some of the use cases only, I mean, quote unquote, only needed to be able to perform distributed basic operations. So maybe they have already a, a NumPy based tool, for example, that's uh, using mostly or calling mostly linear algebra statistics manipulation operations. And they want to be able to run this tool on memory distributed arrays, which you cannot do with NumPy or uh, uh, yeah, on big cluster or, or including on GPUs. And uh, most of the use, case, use cases uh, adopt common machine learning algorithms for uh, labeling, for example, or like uh, k-means, scikit-learn, k-means, k-nearest neighbors, and so on. But some of them needed something a bit more complex, like uh, singular value decomposition, principal component analysis, and I mean more complex now, at least from a parallel implementation point of view. And finally, a subset of use cases, especially those dealing with the medical imaging, involve uh, neural networks. So, um, right, fast forward three years later, and uh, now you know why HEAT, our uh, uh, Python library HEAT, looks a bit like a, a distributed tensor library in an identity crisis. So there's a basic operation, NumPy-like part. There's a a parallel machine learning part that's more like scikit-learn. And there's a data parallel neural networks part that is more like PyTorch. It's, you can distribute a PyTorch uh, neural networks training with. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go very briefly into the heat, the basic operations part, because it's the foundation, right? And uh, um, Yes, so as I said, uh, he adheres strictly as possible, at least in the basic operations uh, to uh, part to the NumPy API. The greatest difference, the greatest difference being that um, when you wrap your data in a heat array, and we call it DND array for distributed ND array, you can specify the split argument um, which defines the axis along which your array will be distributed across, uh, across the available processes. So each process will only load a slice of the data. You don't have to worry about single node memory as long as you have enough processes to load your data on. So here's a bit uh, 
uh, more of a visual representation of what the split argument really means. And uh, uh, locally, uh, the, so the local data objects are PyTorch tensors. And uh, so process local operations are PyTorch operations. And that covers, of course, uh, process local efficiency. Thank you so much, PyTorch. And uh, eager execution covers GPU support and differentiability of the uh, arrays. But the main thing with it is that the DND array is not treated as a set of separated slices. It's uh, it's uh, a monolith monolithic entity. It's treated as a monolithic entity by heat operations, so that whatever heat function you're calling, of course, if we have implemented it, but we have a lot of them. So whatever function you're calling, it's parallelized under the hood. So the, the needed communication layer is via MPI and MPI for Pi, and that's. Uh, basically what the, the uh, heat developer's job has been to provide this parallelization under the hood. So you can, I'm not going into more details. Uh, you can check out the library on PyPy on GitHub. Um, I wanted to here. I wanted to talk more about difficulties and, and the good luck really we had within the general framework. Um, yes, so biggest hurdle we encountered was for sure hiring developers for an academic research project. This is really quite difficult. Uh, in fact, the, the dev team, the heat dev team is to this day always and permanently understaffed. So <laughs> I'm sure at least from what I'm hearing from uh, the, the uh, research, other re similar research projects we are in touch with, uh, pretty much every uh, scientific development project runs into the same problems. You can hire scientists, turn developers who are usually at least in the beginning a bit sl like slow developers, um, or uh, you can try to hire professional developers, but first of all, they're not going to be willing to be underpaid in academia for more than a few months, maybe a year. And the second, you do need to then have some intermediate figure or several figures to interface the developers' brains with the scientists. And also this is quite anecdotal, but my experience is at least in my former community, scientists were uh, really highly skilled at software development, still will shy away from scientific development roles because they feel they might jeopardize their uh, scientific career. And so, uh, I guess I'm coming back to job safety. Scientific developers need job, safe, job safety, of course, like everybody else, I would say. Uh, but um, uh, this is really a, a, a category of, uh, of uh, scientific generalists that has it really tough in a, a specialist dominated research world. And unless they switch out of uh, academia really early, they also has it quite tough in the, or they, they, they might have it quite tough in the uh, software development industry because um, they were not trained as software developers or software engineers. Okay, so anyway, <laughs> sorry about cats. Uh, within the Helmholtz analytic frameworks, we ended up with a pretty heterogeneous group of scientists. So with different level of, levels of experience and uh, with different levels of expertise, really. Uh, in the team, we have one computer scientist, two informaticians, one neuroscientist, and five physicists. But the five physicists, including myself, are from the most disparate branches of physics. So we are really like not the same species, <laughs> I think. Um, I forgot to ask my team about, uh, for permission to use their pictures before I left on, some, on, on holiday, on a summer break. So I hope you can tolerate the cat emojis to replace our, uh, our pictures. Um, that's the German part of my brain playing it safe with uh, um, privacy. So these are the uh, heat core developers, plus a few brilliant minds who have contributed less code maybe, but many ideas, especially uh, at the beginning of the project. Um, I want to mention Marcus Goetz specifically. 
Uh, he's at the Karlsruhe Institute for Technology. He's been leading the heat development pretty much from the beginning, basically just out of his PhD. Um, really, I cannot speak highly enough of this talented young leader. If you get the chance to work with him, take it. I also want to mention Daniel, uh, Daniel Coughlin, who started out in Newlich, has now moved to uh, Karlsruhe as well. Um, he's certainly our most prolific developer. He almost single-handedly hammered out the linear algebra module and uh, uh, the data parallel neural networks uh, module, among many other things. Um, and then I want to mention Charlie Debus, who's, in my opinion, one of the most brilliant minds on the team. And she's unfortunately one of the most brilliant minds of many teams. So the time she devotes to heat is less and less, uh, but uh, you can really thank her for a lot of the parallel machine learning implementation within heat and uh, for a lot of the um, uh, communication layer, the really tough abstract uh, MPI stuff. And then I want to mention Philip Knechges and uh, Kai Kreisek. Uh, they have contributed uh, maybe less code, but the bigger ideas, uh, among other things, they have been working on a, a MPI for Torch library that I forgot to uh, um, write here, but uh, you can look it up, MPI for number, number four Torch, uh, that will eventually be merged into heat and allow for uh, uh, distributed automated differ differentiation. That's a really big thing. And then we have our uh, continuous integration gods, uh, Björn Hagemeyer and uh, Michael Tanava. And uh, Björn was, has also taken on a lot of the coordinating between the developers, uh, well, most of the coordinating, I would say, between the developers and the uh, use cases. Okay, so what I want to mention here really is uh, uh, is how well the team got around this, I, I think it was unavoidable, this initial calibration of, uh, recalibration of the group dynamics. It's a group in which seniority and experience don't necessarily match. I mean, for me as a, uh, like a, a senior uh, staff scientist, um, it wasn't that obvious that it would work so well. So uh, we were bound to have cu uh, culture clashes from coming from so many different communities, but. Uh, really, for me, coming as a, basically a, a senior beginner in parallel computing, um, uh, and you can tell from our code base, it's not just me. I mean, most of us aren't professional, devel professional developers, uh, but no matter, this is really a group in which it felt always from the beginning, it felt okay to make mistakes, to oh, even low-level mistakes, basic, you know, uh, standard library Python questions. Um, when you mix people from so many different backgrounds, that's really uh, a good environment to have. And I have to say, we also, uh, at least the, the scientists on the team, we also understand users' need, needs in a way that that's, I think a, a, a team fully staffed with professional developers uh, probably couldn't. Of course, they would produce the library in one third of the time, but... <laughs> okay. So, well, while preparing this talk, I had almost forgotten that roughly one third of this project was run under pandemic conditions. And if I look back at all the progress we made in the last year, it almost looks like, you know, for us as a distributed remote team, it was sort of, a, it, in the beginning, it kind of felt like business as usual. Um, in the last year and a half, our heat paper was accepted at IEEE Big Data 2020. That was a really big thing for us. We went through major code overhaul. We kept implementing new features to support the use cases. We kept submitting papers and presenting heat at conferences. We wrapped up the Helmholtz Analytic Framework this uh, spring quite successfully, I think. Um, it, Eventually, we were, quite surprisingly, we were approached by Intel developers and have started a collaboration with them. I could go on. There were all sorts of few things that didn't work so well. I mean, we uh, kind of lost touch a bit with some of the use cases needs and we were too slow to respond to inquiries from new users. Uh, but overall, I think 
we had a very productive year and a half. And of course, as I said, it helped a lot that, that, that Lisa Heat developers started out as a distributed team that collaborates asynchronously anyway, that shies away from unnecessary meetings. I mean, we are totally meeting lazy, uh, but I don't want to brush the strain of pandemic operations under the rug. Uh, in fact, I mean, I, I tried to put together a slide that, can, that would effectively convey this strain uh, for the last year and a half, and I think I uh, failed. Uh, this slide does give me a bit of anxiety, but not as much as we had really in the last year. Uh, we went through the whole spectrum of uh, loneliness to overcrowd being overcrowded. I have three kids, everybody on a video call, on a video call at the same time, uh, endless interruptions, and some of us were worrying about the next career step and so on. It was really uh, quite a strain that I don't want to, as I said, I don't want to brush it off so easily. I should get my kids uh, Hawaiian shirts, I just realized. Uh, yesterday while I looked for the where are my pants Lego guy. Anyway, what worked? Um, well, sometimes I think the fact that some of us started out pretty clueless about what we were doing and the landscape in which we were operating, I think that cluelessness was actually one of the reasons why we kept going. I mean, speaking for myself, uh, I didn't stop to wonder, can we really do something different or even better than Dusk and Cupai and Cupai and so on? Um, no, I was learning all the time. I was uh, uh, learning new things. I was solving, and like everybody else on the team, we were solving difficult abstract problems that in the beginning, at least we weren't used to. Each of us could find something <laughs> low boredom, high safety to do because the skills on the team were so heterogeneous. So I like to think that we had uh, uh, very forward-looking management in place when the heat developers team was put together. I also kind of know that a lot of it was just was luck or let's say ent enthusiasm on our side. So anyway, we ended up with a toolkit that at least some of our use cases are, uh, some of our use cases are actively using for their applications and that allows them to uh, carry out the data analysis that were just weren't able to do before. And that's especially true for those use cases who were lucky enough to be able to hire uh, dedicated developers for this project. Um, that's, uh, for example, I want to mention the uh, terrestrial systems monitoring use case, where there was the uh, earth system modeling that I mentioned earlier that um, hired uh, Daniel Cochlein uh, at, at the beginning of the project, they hired uh, Daniel first, and he's probably contributed the most lines of code to the library, and uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, a lot of features. And then later they uh, hired Ben Burgard, who is uh, currently our uh, main source of uh, bug reports. So thank you so much, Ben. Um, Yes, uh, a similar uh, fate was also for the second neuroscience um, use case who, whom I, I'm uh, supporting in porting their NumPy tool to, to heat and they can now uh, run some statistics that they just couldn't uh, do before. So finally, um, well, almost finally, I have two finalists here, I think. I want to mention uh, from my point of view, the greatest lucky turn, <laughs> even if it sounds funny to say it like that, as far as I'm concerned, early on in the project, uh, one of us, probably the most meeting lazy, uh, Philip, uh, suggested to replace our bi-weekly video call uh, with text meetings on our Matamos, on our chat. I just cannot overstate the impact that text meetings had on my onboarding and, and even later being able to research on um, discussions that were going on uh, during the meetings, but I just wasn't able to follow in, in real time. 
um, and that was just awesome. Even to this day, I go back to uh, uh, discussions that happened two years ago uh, because I now remember, oh, there was something, uh, but now I understand it. And maybe two years ago, I didn't quite understand all of it. Also, it saves us a lot of time because students join the, the developer uh, team for a limited time, but they join all the time and, and then they leave. They have access to all the information, the previous discussions to links. Really, I think any group having regular meetings and the heterogeneous uh, skill set should consider switching to text meetings. And again, this probably, uh, you know, known facts if you are in, uh, in software development, but in academia, it's not that obvious. So, and uh, finally, I want to mention, I already mentioned it earlier, but uh, one uh, major lucky turn was, uh, uh, being approached by Intel for a, a possible collaboration for their one API. Um, and this was recently at the time where, when the Helmholtz Analytics framework funding was about to run out and further development, uh, heat further development was, I mean, we knew it was going to go on, but we didn't quite know why, uh, I mean, how, <laughs> we knew why, we didn't, we weren't sure how. So of course, having an industry leader interested in what we do makes it easier to secure, secure more public funding. Um, I'm not uh, really into the tiniest details of the collaboration, but they are openly contributing to our repository, so, so you can have a look there. Okay. So now, room for improvement. Okay, this is more of a... I mean, if I could do it all over again, thought experiment um, from the development point of view, I think the main thing that, that probably slowed us down and that we could have handled better with, even within our boundary conditions is that uh, the roles within the team were a bit fuzzy. But I think it was justified in the beginning because we all had, had to find our, uh, our place, uh, but maybe they, they, they wouldn't need to be so fuzzy now. So uh, to be sure, a lot gets done, but it's mostly on a volunteering basis. So it tends to crystallize. And uh, of course, in the sense that developers who take on a task or maybe the implementation of a feature or whatever, fixing a bug, then they are sort of the implied default person for that piece of code for the task. And uh, obviously the workload distribution gets really skewed really fast. <laughs> and also people end up specializing. We don't want that. Of course, I know if you have a, a software engineering background, by now you're probably thinking, uh, yeah, these are the basics, right? We learned it uh, in the first semester. Um, because I'm in Italy now, I want to mention this kind of insight is what Italians call discovering hot water. And this is totally not the same as reinventing the wheel. So uh, if you need a nice new I idiom, uh, keep this in mind. However, I think one of the main features of data science projects within research is in fact that they are somewhat depleted of software engineering skills. So uh, for those of you that at some point will find themselves putting together a bunch of scientists to produce software, be prepared. They might be absolutely or vehemently against Scrum, but at least establishing some kind of rota from the beginning, especially for the more tedious tasks might be a good idea. Uh, it's not just about distributing the workload, of course. It's in a small, especially in small teams, you want to you want everybody to be able to be able to do almost everything. And of course, boredom needs to be distributed. I think uh, I, you, you see, I have a boredom theme here, and I also found myself a nice little uh, niche role within the team for that. Okay. Within the entire framework, um, again, if I could do it all over again, the one thing I would definitely change uh, and where I think really we could have done better uh, is uh, um, I think the developers should have been more proactive in supporting students and, and the early stage domain scientists. 
we kind of assumed that they would get in touch with us if they had questions and problems. But uh, I think the hurdle for them to create GitHub issues, to uh, then keep pulling at our sleeve to get their issues solved, um, at that stage of, uh, of that scientist career, it's, uh, it was just too high. And it was just uh, a, a low safety, uh, high boredom activity that uh, in the end it didn't happen. So not as much as we expected. So if I could do it again, or maybe in the next phase of the project, I would certainly set up some kind of a dedicated support channel for, uh, for students, for early career scientists and certainly keep more of an eye on the student timelines because uh, they really have tight deadlines, deadlines. Okay. Ah, yes, I think I'm almost done. So, no knowns, no unknowns, and a non unknowns. Let's see, I think I've mentioned our no knowns already. The ongoing work is uh, working on um, parallel singular value decomposition, um, more complex um, machine learning algorithms than we have now. So uh, SVD, uh, principal component analysis and uh, optimization of uh, data parallel neural networks training. Um, and there's ongoing work, as I mentioned, on uh, uh, distributed automatic differentiation. We have this uh, just started ongoing Intel collaboration, which we hope will uh, continue. So no unknowns. Um, these are projects that we are kind of uh, trying to get started uh, and uh, mostly uh, deal with dissemination, heat dissemination beyond the uh, Helmholtz analytic, analytics framework use cases. Of course, we, we, we would like other uh, scientists to, to try the library as well and, um, and to use it if it helps them. So uh, one group we are in touch with recently is the, uh, our local Earth system data exploration uh, in Julich. That's uh, Martin Schulz and uh, Felix Kleinert. Um, then we have a possible kind of up in the air uh, collaboration with the uh, universe and matter big data, big science uh, projects. Uh, that's a, a German um, call for proposals. It's a pretty big thing where we started to work on. And then, of course, my fixed idea, but it's, I mean, that's literally uh, up in the clouds and above is uh, maybe at some point eventually to send heat to space. Okay, of course, a non unknowns, who knows? Uh, your use case, I mean, if you have something interesting that you want us to work on, get in touch. Um, or if we can help you in any way, get in touch. GitHub would be the best for that. Um, and I would like to thank, well, my management, first of all. That's uh, Daniel Malman and Björn Hagemeyer the, from the um, Federated Systems and Data Division in, uh, at the Jülich Supercomputing Center. Daniel is the division uh, head and Bjorn is a team lead. Um, they hired me in 2017. They gave me safety. They gave me time to figure things out, to learn all the, well, a part at least of the things I needed to learn. I don't think I'm done that yet. Um, yes. And they gave me fun stuff to do. That was, uh, uh, they really put me in that nice green square where I wanted to be. And Marcus Goetz uh, also tolerated quite a bit of my cluelessness, especially in the beginning. Um, very great, gracefully, very graciously. And then I would like to uh, thank our student contributors, um, Lena, Ben, uh, the two Simons, Jakob, Luca and Fabrice, and I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. Uh, that's uh, certainly, I'm thinking more that uh, came in and went. Um, students are really the better coders in this, uh, in this project. So I really enormously enjoy uh, working directly with them because I learned so much. Um, and uh, uh, of course, they also learn a bit of the scientific perspective. Also, I want to mention, I'm not sure that I could have switched to data science um, so late in my career 
I mean, in my in my forties, uh, without Coursera, um, without the fantastic Python Python three deep dive um, that's Fred Fred Baptiste, and uh, uh, also a great resource for uh, uh, to understand uh, parallel computing and message passing interface is the uh, EPCC uh, online class that I've linked here. I don't know if. I will send in slides later, I suppose. Uh, you will have the links there if you're interested. And I think, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Claudia. That was a very inspiring talk and thank you for all the insights that you uh, gave in terms of, you know, how scientific projects are run. And I think that's an area where, you know, not many of us can actually relate to because most of us were probably from, you know, the software development industry and, and there, of course, things work a little differently. Um, also, yep. I think that most of us will probably work in you know, smaller projects, not these big ones, not like, you know, between institutes uh, spread across Europe. So that's very interesting. Mm -hmm. We have lots of questions. Um, I'm going to just ask Thank a few so of those. Much. I'm going to, I'm going to post the rest into the uh, breakout room. And I would like you to, to join the breakout room after the session. So I'll try <laughs> one, one question that, that, uh, that got a lot of, um, a lot of um, uh, feedback uh, was uh, this one. You mentioned text meetings is a new concept for me. Uh, and what does it actually comprise of? Well, that's surprising <laughs> because I thought it would be kind of uh, <laughs> common, especially in, uh, in uh, software engineering and software development. Well, we have a, a, a Matamos. I'm not sure if um, it's, it's a chat, right? Uh, a Slack kind of thing, and um, we have different channels where we discuss. We, we are in touch pretty much all the time, but we have a dedicated channel that we call uh, optimistically sprint meetings. <laughs> in, <laughs> although our attempt to scrum has uh, you know crashed really fast, uh, very much in the beginning. But anyway, the channel name is uh, stayed and. Um, every two weeks at a given time, we meet um, in this specific channel and we all come together and uh, discuss things that are going on. I, uh, I especially uh, like it when we talk about things, not so much about, you know, you know, this is what I've done. I don't care about that. It's on GitHub, right? Uh, what, I, what, I'm, what, what we care about is uh, what problems we are uh, uh, running into, where we kind of think we are, we need help or we are getting stuck. Um, distributing issues. That's what uh, the boredom master <laughs> does usually. Uh, <laughs> Um, distributing issues that are, you know, have been there for a long time and nobody takes them on or uh, planning the next release, this kind of stuff. So we kind of join in this specific channel. Uh, we try try to all be there at the same time for maybe half an hour, one hour. And uh, it works really well because the discussion is there to read, right? For people who can't attend or if later you want to go back to it. Right, I can very much relate to that. I'm, you know, very much on your side related to uh, to these uh, text meetings because I'm having too many in-person meetings or, you know, like nowadays virtual meetings and they take so much time. So, not very absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, next question is uh, this one: Do you have any? Uh, do you have some ideas on how to best retain technical people in science and give them a career path and recognition? So you mentioned some of that already in the talk but perhaps you can go a bit more into detail. Uh, well, um, my main idea would be, guys, you know, universities uh, cough up those permanent positions because uh, if you don't get publications because you're working on software and uh, if nobody even knows you exist because, because uh, they use your software but uh, they, they might have never met you really, um, it's really tough, right? So I, I think uh, there needs to be, um, it needs to be more like uh, front and center um, 
on group leaders or professors' minds that uh, these people need more safety, right? Uh, more of a job safety. I, I unfortunately I don't have uh, <laughs> I don't have solutions, but I think science is a bit of a big uh, uh, it's a big field. So in, in fundamental research, it's quite difficult, especially in Germany. You don't have this middle level permanent positions. You either either become a professor or you are on uh, uh, three year contracts all your life basically. And uh, in applied science, for example, I was I'm totally grateful and lucky. My pro position has turned to permanent uh, this year. But that's because in applied science and where I'm working, there is a real competition with the industry. So, I mean, we just leave after a while if we don't feel safe. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, another question here. I'm just going to do one more question. Um, very quick one. Uh, someone was asking where the job offers are listed. Obviously, we have the people interested in maybe JSC and the Helmholtz. Yes, uh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to post the links on the in the breakout room. I think okay, that's, a, that's a excellent. better solution. Mm. Right. So, right. So to wrap up, thank you very much again for the talk. That was very interesting. And well, uh, thank you so much. I hope you're going to try the library. Yes, of course. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> We haven't, uh, I, I didn't put up any questions about the library. There are questions about the library, of course. I'm going to copy all the questions that I have noted mm -hmm. into the breakout room chat so you can then discuss them there on, on Jitsi. So thanks again. Okay, thank you so much. It was and great to be here. <laughs> thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.